Well, let's, uh, let's take our Bibles, please, and uh, turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We, uh, in this session, we like to consider the, the subject of replacement theology and uh, the place of Israel uh, in the scriptures. And before we get into that, I want to mention uh, back on the book table a couple of books. I want to mention uh, there are some magazines. If you don't receive Cornerstone a magazine mailed to you or, or a missions magazine, a missions excellent magazine, uh, it's probably the most subscribed magazine in assembly uh, thousands that go out in North America and in Canada and electronically overseas. And uh, it keeps you up to date with a lot that's going on. Uh, missions wise and some great articles. And so uh, you can sign up and there's some sample magazines back there. I uh, just want to mention a couple of the books that are on the back table. And um, there's uh, His Dying Request. That's about the Lord's Supper. Uh, some of my articles in writing, but a lot of classic uh, chapters on the Lord's Supper. C.H. Spurgeon, I have a chapter from his writings and uh, a number of others. And um, we'll be looking at this subject, replacement theology. That is back there. Um, very, very current with some things that are happening today in the land of Israel. And uh, this book is a little primer on dispensationalism. If you're wondering what it's about and trying to get a, a grasp on it and a look at it, uh, this is a book on that subject. Um, it, it's encouraging to me that it's used as a textbook uh, for new tribes missions. So that's pretty encouraging to me, uh, uh, used in the, uh, in the Wisconsin area. This book is Limiting Omnipotence. This is on the subject of Calvinism, some of the issues relating to that. And if you're interested in that, that's a, a book that's probably my most uh, popular book, if you could call it that. Um, this book is on personal holiness. The battle is the Lord's and goes a little bit hand in hand what our brother has been speaking about. And this book is my newest book called No Little Places. It's, um, it's a book that I've wanted to, wanted to write for 20 years. And um, my thoughts and I think biblical thoughts on, on the church and um, and that the local church, Warren Wordsby said, there are no little churches and there's no little people. There's only a great God. And I think that's, that's a little bit of what that book is about. Well, let's, uh, let's open the scriptures. We're in Romans chapter 11. We're going to go back to Romans chapter 11 a little bit later, but I just want to look at it, just read it and make a few comments and then get into uh, the bulk of what we want to look at this, the, this afternoon. By the way, I want to say it was a wonderful lunch. I think, um, I think Raju and I and anyone who's visiting, uh, this is probably one of the best conference lunches I've ever seen. Uh, I didn't know when the table was going to end uh, for the lunch, and then the dessert table is like three tables long. Usually it's a one table, you know, one table dessert kind of thing at conferences. But uh, you guys did a great, great, fantastic job. It was delicious. And thank you very, very much for that. Chapter 11, beginning with verse 1 uh, of the book of Romans. I say then, Paul writing, <clears throat> hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I'm an Israelite, the seed of Abraham the tribe of Benjamin, God has not cast away his people that he foreknew. Know you not what the scripture saith, Elijah, how he makes intercession, and so forth. Twice we have, has God cast away his people? And the apostle Paul writes, God forbid. So in this session, we want to look at what does the Bible say about, uh, about Israel and Israel. Has God set aside Israel? Does Israel have no future plan in, in, God's, in God's economy? Has the church replaced Israel and Israel has no more? We will not hear of any more about Israel 
in the Word of God. Now, you know, Israel occupies about 75% of the Bible. All the Old Testament, all the Gospels, the uh, uh, book of Acts into chapter 13, Revelation, much of Revelation about Israel, book of James, other places we see Israel all through the letters the Apostle Paul reading here in Romans chapter 11. 75% of the Bible, 800 times we read of the city of, 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 of Jerusalem, we read of the, the word Israel hundreds and hundreds of times. It's almost, a, it's almost amazing to hear uh, the idea that the church has replaced Israel. Now, the church has a very important role, and Israel has a very important role. And they both have an important role in God's economy. Amen. Angels have a great role in God's economy. Many different groups. We read about in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, read about Gentiles, Jews, Gentiles in the church of God. We have different groups of people and God is working with them all. And because God's working with the church in this dispensation primarily, it doesn't mean he's cast aside Israel. It doesn't mean that, that Israel has been replaced by the church. Now, in this last session, I had a quotation by Matthew Henry about the regathering of Israel. And he began to say it's related to the gospel church. The church has replaced, will fulfill some spiritualized way, some figurative way, replace, will inherit that promise. And so you hear this kind of thing. There's been a number of books that have come out. And when you, when you go to places like London, England, and other places where you have a high population of Muslims, Islam, you find this being a very, very strongly preached message among very good churches. To speak about Israel today, a number of years ago, Fairhaven Bible Chapel in California, near Berkeley, uh, California. They were having a conference about Israel, the number of, of uh, Jewish ministries. They had protests outside for days before the conference. They had articles written about, though, how could anyone, anyone, how could they ever think of speaking anything in a positive way about Israel? Now, back in 1948, when Israel became a nation, 1948, May 15th, when, uh, <clears throat> when President Truman cast the deciding vote in the UN, when that happened, uh, the world rejoiced. Evangelicals rejoiced the loudest. It was a wonderful time in history. But very soon after that, they were invaded. They were invaded in 1956. They were invaded in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. They were, invited, they were invaded over and over in 1967. And every time they were, had war and every time they were invaded, they gained more territory. But then because of international pressure, they gave it back over and over and over again. But today, to speak about Israel, even in churches, we find there's a certain reluctance to do that, a certain distaste, even among evangelical Christians, for Israel. Now, we're not saying that Israel, as a government, does everything exactly correct. So don't, don't think that they're perfect. There's no nation that's perfect. If you find the nation that's perfect, you're in the millennium. You're not, you're not on earth right now. So they're not perfect. But God is, we can't say that God's not working through them. We can't say that God doesn't have a future for them. And so that's what we want to look at this morning, the, the, this afternoon. Now, this is the hardest part of this conference. Maybe Brother Raju has maybe even a harder part than I have. But after lunch, <laughs> the session after lunch, there's something about the digestive juices beginning to work after the meal that we had. That coffee and lemonade and iced tea all working together, it sort of just closes our eyes a little bit. I'm going to do the best. This is really going to be an exciting session, so I'm going to do the best <laughs> to keep you wide awake 
But um, as David Gooding used to say, I don't mind if you, if you sleep, but please do not snore. <laughs> but I understand after a session, I, I, I've been there myself. So I know it's very difficult. <laughs> well, let's get into our passage. What is, what is replacement theology? Let me give you a, a definition. Uh, replacement theology is the unbiblical doctrine that God has rejected Israel because of unbelief, and now the church receives the promises and blessings of the Old Testament given to Israel. Now, allow me to give you a rental showers one-time Bible teacher with, uh, with friends of Israel. Now he's passed away, he's with the Lord. He says, replacement theology is the theological view that the world that claims God is forever finished with Israel as a nation. Therefore, God's promises in the Abrahamic covenant and all the other covenants to give Israel physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, notice that phrase, the physical descendants, the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land of Canaan as an eternal inheritance are no longer effect in Israel. I'm going to quote a number of, of people. Don't think that I dislike and condemn everything they've ever written. But this is a statement by John Piper. John Piper is a, someone who believes in replacement theology. In fact, he's written very strongly. Uh, you can go on the internet, place where everything resides. John MacArthur has written a long 20 page, 20 reasons why we need to support Israel. And John Piper has responded to that. So it's clear that, uh, that he's not in support of of Israel. The promises made to Abraham, including the promise of land, will only be inherited as an everlasting gift by true believing Israel. So that's the church. They're part of the church. Not disobedient, unbelieving Israel. In other words, the promises cannot be demanded by anyone because they're Jewish or the descendants of Abraham. Being born Jewish doesn't make anyone an heir of a promise, neither the promise of land or any other promise. Well, we'll see in Scripture if that's true. David Chilton, he is a post-millennialist. It seems that post-millennialists are virulent, very strong, almost hatred for the nation of Israel and anything regarding Israel. And their language is very strong. Because Israel committed the supreme act of covenant breaking when she rejected Christ, not all of Israel rejected Christ. The early church was made up of, his, of, of those from a, from a Jewish background. Amen. The leaders rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel herself was rejected by God. We never read that. We just read a passage uh, in Romans, which was written about 30 years after uh, the death of Christ, where he says that Israel still has not been cast away by, by God. I, I take that as being inspired the word of God. I take it that the Apostle Paul is inspired when he wrote those words. Israel herself was rejected by God. The awesome curses pronounced by Jesus and Moses, the prophets, were fulfilled in the terrible destruction of Jerusalem with the desolation of the temple, which did happen in 70 AD, and the obliteration of the covenant nation in 70 AD. That did happen. And in 132 AD, there was further destruction of Israel. That did happen. But it doesn't mean that God, that God was the one doing that. He permitted it, but he's not rejected his people. R.C. Sproul, not R.C. Senior, but R.C. Sproul was an editor of a magazine called Table Talk. Uh, he says, God is finished with Israel, been replaced Israel with the people, with the church. We believe the church essentially is uh, essentially Israel. We believe that the answer is, what about the Jews? He says, here we are. We, we, we inherit all the promises that God made to the Old Testament Israel. 
Let me think about it a little bit. 75% of the Bible speaks about Israel. Israel, the word Israel, the name of, of uh, Jacob, name used for Jacob, is mentioned 2,000 times in the Bible. 2,000 times, almost more than anything else. Maybe the word God is used more, more than that, but two th that's quite a few, that's a pretty good number, 2,000. Jerusalem is mentioned 800 times. Israel is described as my land, 144 times. The land is, of Israel is called my land, the glory of all lands, the land which I care for, the beautiful land. But what about the scriptures? I, I, I encourage you to turn to it. I know we have these overhead things and so forth. We have a tendency to keep our Bibles closed. But I really encourage you to turn to it and encourage you if you have a, you know, I, I, I like colored pencils. I've got a, a bag full of colored pencils. And sometimes, I, I, you know, like over there, I'm coloring my Bible in. Or you've got a marker, a highlighter. I encourage you uh, to highlight a number of different things. But Genesis 13, 15 I really encourage you to highlight some of these passages and some of the key words in them. So chapter 13, verse 15, it says this, For all the land that you see, for all the land that thou seest to thee, now he's speaking to Abraham, to thee, you can circle that, put an arrow over to your margin, Abraham, to thee, Abraham, I will give it. God says, I will give it as a gift to you. And they are tenants of the land. It's still God's land, and they're tenants of that land. And then this last word in this verse, forever. Forever. Does it mean that it's abrogated when they're disobedient? Were they, was it taken away and removed when the high priest and the leading priest wanted the Lord Jesus crucified, was they taken away when the, the city of the Romans destroyed the temple? Forever means forever means forever means forever. I will give it as a gift forever. That was verse 13. He speaks about this to Abraham, to thee, Abraham. He doesn't say in that passage to your descendants, but he says, to thee and all the land that you see, I will give it as a gift to thee forever. But when you come to chapter 17, I encourage you to go to that passage. I will establish my covenant between me and you and, and thy seed after thee in all their generations. So we have, now we have all of Israel. We have to thee, now we've added to that promise and to your seed, and not only your, your seed of Isaac and Jacob, but all the generations that follow. That's all of Israel, all of ethnic national Israel. He doesn't say believing Israel. I don't read that in that text. Only to believing Israel, I will give it to your seed. And the generations following you for an everlasting covenant, and covenant means a promise, a promise to you. And then it says, says uh, in the middle of the verse, verse 8, and I will give it unto thee and thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a sojourner, all the land of Canaan, again, for an everlasting covenant. I'm uh, sorry, everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now it's the descendants and all the generations as a possession forever. Everlasting possession. How big is the land? What are the boundaries of the land? I was, we, we were having a home Bible study. And uh, I decided to have some visuals in this home Bible study. You know, we can't do PowerPoint in home Bible studies, but I decided to do a visual, and I printed off a map of Israel. This particular map of Israel showed the area uh, that was given to the Palestinians. 
And uh, you can look at this. It's quite, a, it's quite a portion of land. The West Bank is quite a large portion of land. The Gaza Strip is, is relatively small. But the West Bank is very large. You look at the postage stamp land of Israel, and you say, what is this? What are they all fighting about? They've got fair, a fair amount of land, but they want all the land. And I know there's all kinds of battles and all kinds of arguments about this. But what is the boundaries? Well, we're told what the boundaries are. Genesis 15, 18. Unto thy seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, unto the great river Euphrates. That goes over in, 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 in Iran or I, Iraq and all the way down quite a, quite a distance. Now, when you look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, from the wilderness and this Lebanon to the north, unto the great river, that's the Nile, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, down towards the sea, the Red Sea, going down of the sun shall be your border. So what are we talking about? Look at that. Now, this is a, just a generalized map, but that squiggly line, that's, the, that's your Euphrates. And then north of that to the Lebanon, and down to the, down to the, uh, uh, down to the Nile, and then the land of the Hittites. We're not sure exactly. This is a general kind of idea. Well, that's the, that's the borders, future borders of this everlasting land that was given to Israel. Something like that. In 1967, when the various Arab nations surrounding Israel, you look at some of the Arab nations, I think 22 Arab nations surrounding Israel, population in the, the millions and millions. Israel, I believe, uh, is about six million, about a million and a half uh, Palestinians and another four and a half uh, Jewish. But in the 1967 war, they took all the West Bank, they took all of East Jerusalem, took all of Jerusalem, took the temple, temple area. Some, more radical, were going to go in there and begin to offer sacrifices. And uh, they took all the Sinai Peninsula. That's that long piece there. Even today, they still control about a third of the Sinai Peninsula. Now, it's an international patrolled area with a multinational forces in that, in that border area of the Sinai Peninsula. Because that's where Egypt came across with their tanks and attacked Israel. The area closer to Egypt is, uh, is Egypt allows to be controlled by, I think, 22,000 troops in that area. And uh, if you go there, it's a great place to go scuba diving. Uh, and it's a very popular tourist destination. Of course, Mount Sinai is there, and a lot of Christians go uh, to that area. But they took all of that area in 1967. But because of international uh, pressure, they gave back almost all of it. In 1993. And then, in 2001, they gave them the West Bank, and they gave them the Gaza Strip, and uh, they gave them the Golan Heights. Israel's done all this for peace, and they haven't had any peace. They did all of that, and they still, of course, the most recent situation, uh, because they want all of this land. Israel has a really a very small area of land. Now, I've been to Israel. The southern part of Israel uh, is very barren, very few trees, very few farms and vegetation to the south. It's desert-like in the south. It's a very, and the north part, is, so they, they've, they've turned it into... A lot, of, uh, a, a lot of citrus growing and a lot of farms. And it's been a very industrialized nation for the size of the nation. It's amazing what they've accomplished. And yet, when you look at Israel, that little space, but what God has promised them is something very different. So 
What is the background to replacement theology? Let's just look a little bit. So the early church was, was Jewish in composition, but slowly became more and more Gentile in composition in the first century. And the Gentiles began to not put a lot of consideration into the promises in the Old Testament and all those promises made to Israel became greater and greater in composition. And we'll look at this in a minute. And then there's the Jewish revolt of 66 to 70 AD and the, destruct and the destruction of the temple. And then in 132 to 135, another uprising. And this time, Rome comes in with great force and destroys Jerusalem, destroys the city, destroys it to, uh, raises it to the ground, and says no Jew can live in Jerusalem, and changes the name of, of this land to Palestine, and changes the name of, of uh, Jerusalem to uh, uh, Aelio Capitolia, which was the name of a Roman emperor, Aelio Hadranius. No Jew could live there. So we get more and more Gentile composition of the church and then we have the Reformation and some of the early leaders adding on to that and joining in in this, in this replacement theology idea. So the Jewish War of 66 to 70 AD, and uh, if you're interested in reading more about that, you can get a book by Josephus, still in print, about the called the, the Jewish War. And uh, it's not 100% accurate. He's very sympathetic to the, to the Romans. Um, he was a high priest, or he was a priest, and, but later on he was more sympathetic to the Romans. So he puts the Romans in good light uh, in his Jewish war. But it's a very good book, very interesting to see what's taking place. It's only about that big uh, to buy the book, or the bigger version is, is longer. General Vespasian and uh, his son, General Titus, invades Israel in 67 AD. Herod's temple, after seven month battle is destroyed. The entire city of Jerusalem is burned to the ground. A million one hundred thousand are killed in the Roman siege. 97,000 Jewish young men under the age of 17 are taken as slaves. Now, if you ever go to Rome, in the downtown part of Rome, there's what's called the Ark of Titus. And in that ark, in that arch, arch rather, uh, you, have the, you have an engraving, and the engraving is Titus taking back these 97,000 Jewish men, 17 years or older, as slaves. Amazing thing. Now, if that was today, it might be destroyed because of this ethnic cleansing kind of thing that took place, but it's still there today. Masada was taken in 73 to 74, about 1,000 Sicarii and Zealots took their lives in suicide. And the Romans, with great force, took, took Israel, burned the city. That's one thing that happened. Jewish revolt of 132 to 135, I just mentioned this, and uh, another revolt, but they came in with great force, a different general, and they built a new city, Rebuilt it, called it Aelia Capitolia, uh, after the name of the Roman emperor. And they, they stopped any Jewish, any Hebrew speaking in the city. No Jew was allowed. No Hebrew speaking was allowed. No temple was allowed. The name was changed of the city. The name was changed of Israel to Palestine. We still use that today many times. That's a derogatory thing to say to a Jew when you're speaking to them about their land, that you live in Palestine. The land of Israel was called Palestinia, an attempt to rid all Jewish character of the city. And then you had very early on, you had a lot of leaders, uh, Christian leaders, who began to speak in a very derogatory and anti Jewish way. Justin Martyr, who generally is good in many of the things he writes, he has some defenses of Christianity. 
The destruction of Jerusalem was God's judgment on the Christ-rejecting Jews. Jews justly suffer. The Jewish cities were rightly burned with fire by the Romans. Martin Luther. Some would say Martin Luther was one of the greatest anti-Semites. Now, he was a great reformer. Don't get me wrong. And we are indebted to Martin Luther for many great things. The rediscovering and the re-preaching uh, of justification by faith alone and a key figure in the Reformation. But he was anti-Jewish in an extreme way. Listen, Jew, you are aware, it's a sermon, that Jerusalem and your sovereignty together with your temple and your priesthood has been destroyed 1,460 years ago. This work of the wrath of God is proof that Jews surely rejected by God no longer are no longer his people. Neither is he any longer their God. So begin to see this. Begin to see all this background that's taking place. It just didn't happen in the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 or 50 years. It was a long, a long movement in coming. But let's look, let's look at some text, some more, some, some quotations. C. Spurgeon, along with um, Horatio Bonar and uh, Robert Murray McShane in the 1800s, these were all very, very pro-Israel preachers. In fact, I believe Robert Murray McShane began a mission to the Jews, and he went to Israel. They're very supportive of the restoration of the Jewish nation, although they came from this, this background that we're talking about. And many of their contemporaries did not, did not think in this way. He says, I think we do not attach sufficient importance to the restoration of the Jews. We do not think enough about it. But certainly, if anything is promised in the Bible, it's this. That's a great, great, great statement, really. I am, he says, if anything is promised in the Bible, it is this. The Jews will come back to their land. I imagine you cannot read the Bible without seeing clearly there will be an actual restoration of the children of Israel. May that happy day come soon. Amen. And that's the kind of thing we can say about Israel. We can say that. We can preach that. We don't have to love every single thing they did and are doing today. I think they're doing a lot of good in this war where they have been attacked. I think they've been doing a lot of good in trying to save as much life as they can. But we can preach that. It'll be a happy day when the Lord restores Israel. We'll be a part of that. We'll, we, we'll have a lot of blessing coming to us as well. Now, we want to think for part of our time together, the argument is, is God just blessing believing Israel? Only those who believe, John Piper, no promise to any of Israel unless they're believing. And if they're believing, they're part of the church. Jew and Gentile are part of the church today if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And hallelujah for every Jew. It says to the Jew first, uh, uh, Paul says in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, we preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The message is going out to both of them. And the early part of the, the book of Acts and early part of the work of the apostles goes out to the Jewish nation. And many Jews get saved. And many Gentiles later on also get saved. But the question we want to we think about is this promise we're talking about, the promise we were looking at in the early chapters of, of Genesis is it for believing Israel, or is it for Israel, the seed of Abraham? So let's think a little bit about it. Here's the argument. This is a big argument. Keith Matheson, um, if we note that Israel is defined as nat a natural, national, unbelieving Israel, then Israel is not the church. We discover a different relationship if it's those who are believing Israel. It's a different relationship. They're believers. We are joined one body together under one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want to suggest to you the promise is to the seed of Abraham and his descendants unto generation and generation after that. Not believing Israel, although one day I believe they will be believing. When the Lord comes again in the second coming, at the end of the tribulation period, they will be believing. Louis Burkhoff, professor of systematic theology, probably our brother when he was teaching systematic theology, this is probably an important text in uh, some of his studies. The church existed in the, Old Test uh, in the Old Dispensation, the Old Testament, as well in the New. It was essentially the same. Israel and the church, essentially the same. But let's go back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Now, in verse, in verse 1 into verse 2, he says, Has God cast away his people? Now, keep your finger there in that, in that chapter. Turn back with me just a little bit to Romans chapter 9. Now, Romans chapter 9 is about Israel in its entirety. The whole chapter is about Israel. It's not so much about the election of Gentiles or election of, 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 of those for salvation. It's about Israel. The whole chapter is really about Israel. And you see that when you come to verses 4 and 5. I don't want to look at verse 4 and 5 for a minute. Now, Bible scholars would say this was written somewhere in 60 A.D., 30 years after the death of Christ. Long after the Lord Jesus was crucified, long after the Jews, the Jewish leaders had the Lord Jesus crucified. And uh, these different writers would say, you Jews, don't you know when you rejected Christ, God rejected you. You remember that all your promises, all, all the covenants and all the promises are taken away from you and given to the church because you are Christ rejectors. But let's look at chapter 9 for a minute. 30 years after the death of Christ, or maybe a little longer, what do we read in verse 4? Who are the Israelites? To whom, I'm reading from the King James translation, to whom pertain, present tense, pertain the adoption. They're adopted. Present tense, to whom the glory, to whom pertain the covenants, the promises are still, are still for Israel. It hasn't taken them away. These so-called Christ rejectors, it hasn't been taken away. It still pertains to Israel. The adoption, the glory, the covenants, the promises, the service of God, the priesthood, the service of God and the promises. God has not taken it away because they are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the majority of the Jewish people at this time were not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to chapter 11 with me. But look especially at the last verse of chapter 10. Now, we all know that when the scriptures were written, there were no big letter 11 uh, uh, big numeral 11 when, uh, when Paul was reading. When Paul wrote this, he didn't put all the verses in. I think it was in the 1500s that they began to do that. It was a continuous, it was a continuous text. So the last verse of chapter 10 is very pertinent to chapter 11, verse 1. So look what it says. Now I want to ask you this before I read it. Who is it speaking about? Believing Israel or unbelieving Israel? Now look what it says in verse, verse 21 of chapter 10. To Israel, he saith all day long, I've stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Does that sound believing to you? No, no. But that's the context, right? We said earlier the most important thing in Bible study 
is context, context, context. And then we go into chapter 11, verse 1. A disbelieving and contrary people. And then he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? This is unbelieving Israel. They're not believing in Christ. But he says he has not cast away his people. Now, let's go on. So he says in chapter 11, verse 1, you see then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. I'm an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people. Now, drop down with me to this verse now that is on, on the overhead. Again, who is he referring to? As concerning the gospel, verse 28 of chapter 11, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies. This is their Jewish nation. Concerning the preaching of the gospel that you are preaching, you believers, they are enemies to you for your sakes. But as touching their election, they are chosen people. Touching their election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. They are beloved because of the promises of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the descendants of Israel in the Old Testament. And then he says this. Sometimes this verse is quoted just out of context. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But he's referring to Israel. The gifts given to Israel, the promises given to Israel, God will not change his mind about. When you go to Psalm 87, uh, sorry, Psalm 89, I believe verse 34, uh, I could be, I think it's verse 34. It says, I will not alter that thing that has gone out of my mouth. When he's referring to the covenants of God, I'm not going to alter, I'm not going to change one thing out of the promises that have gone out of my mouth. So, so you see, we ask the question, who is he speaking about here? Who does the promises go to? Believing Israel? I think scripture seems to be clear. It's national, natural, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not believing, not those who are part of the church, promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what about the, the whole aspect of, of the believing? One day before the millennium, before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, it appears near the end of the tribulation period. Israel, and through the preaching, through the tribulation period, through the preaching that takes place, through the work of the Spirit of God in that seven-year period, Thousands upon thousands upon thousands and thousands of Jewish people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the preaching of the 144,000, we come to chapter 7 of Revelation. And we see thousands of Gentiles coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. But thousands and thousands upon is of Israelites will come to faith in the Lord Jesus. Warren Wiersbe and William MacDonald and other Bible scholars will say there'll be a great revival. They look at the passage of Ezekiel 37. Let's turn to that for a minute. Ezekiel 37. You probably know this passage. It's the passage about the dry bones. Now you maybe, I'm sure you've heard the song. Maybe you've sung the song about dry bones. Well, this is the passage where it's drawn from. But there's something very theologically important in this chapter. Look what it says. So Ezekiel's taken to this valley of dry bones by the Lord, and he says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, says Lord, thou knowest. I have no idea if they can live. I don't think they can live. Only you know if they can live. 
And what does God say to him? This is a great theological truth for us. Preach the word of the Lord. What do we do to a, a people that are spiritually dead? We preach the word of the Lord. What about those who are uninterested? We preach the word of the Lord. We preach the word of the Lord. Hey, he, that's what he did. He preached the word of the Lord, and they rose up. They rose up a great people, bone attached to bone and sinew and muscle and skin, and they rose up, it says, a great army. There was some great, it says the Spirit of God. They breathed on them, the Spirit of God, and the preaching of the word of God. And they came to life. And it seemed like this is a passage Many Bible scholars look at it as a time of revival at the end of the tribulation period. Because who is this speaking about? Who is this great coming to life speaking about? When did Israel ever come to life? Did they come to life in the Old Testament? When did they come as a nation to life? During the book of Acts, did they come to life as a nation? Now, look down with me, down at verse chapter 37. And uh, then verse 12, 12 and 13. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, O my people, this is the nation of Israel, O my people, behold, I will open your graves, I will cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land this is a looking forward in a prophetic way to a future end times day. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have opened your graves. Oh, my people, I brought you up out of your graves. And I'll put my spirit in you. And you shall live. I shall place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have performed it. He says, oh, nation of Israel, oh, nation of Judah. Near the end of the tribulation period, back in chapter 11, I'm a little over time, I'll stop in a few minutes. Um, at the end, of the, uh, the end of the tribulation, look with me at chapter uh, 11 and verse, verse 26. So you have this great revival. You have the preaching of the gospel through the tribulation period. Many Jews are progressively getting saved. And then you had this great revival near the end. The Spirit of God comes into them, spiritually makes them alive, a great nation. And look at verse 26. So all Israel shall be saved, those that are not yet still alive in the tribulation period, but those that are alive, all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer. This is the second coming. The Lord comes in the second coming right prior to this period of time. It says there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. They'll become a godly people. They'll become a saved people before they go into the land, into the millennial kingdom. Now look at verse 27. For this is my covenant to them. Unto them I shall take away their sins. Now they will go believing into the millennial kingdom. God has not cast away his people. He's going to do a great work among his people. He's going to do a great work in the tribulation period among Gentiles. And he's doing a great work today among those in our day. Many, many are getting saved. But in a future day, this promise that is to national Israel, natural Israel. They will become believing Israel when they go into the land. <coughs> Trying to see if I have. Anyway, a couple of, just close with one passage and then we'll close in prayer. It's by Warren Wearsby about this whole, this whole discussion that we're having. There are those that interpret this as a meaning of salvation to individuals through the gospel. My conviction, the prophet has a conversion, of, a national conversion of Israel. All Israel shall be saved. Doesn't mean every Jew that ever lived will be converted. 
but Jews living when the Redeemer returns to him will receive him, will be saved. And there are too many details in these Old Testament prophecies of the national restoration to spiritualize and apply them to the church. If God is going to be unfaithful to Israel and all his promises, why should he ever be faithful to us? Are we any better? Are we any better than Israel? I don't think so. But we have a great God with great promises who will fulfill those promises. And we look forward to the future day Amen. in the millennial kingdom where God will bring Jew and Gentile together and fulfill all his promises. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your great, sovereign, mighty, amazing plan for Israel. In many ways, it's been unbelieving and un unfaithful. And you've always been faithful. You've never cast them off. And one day you will restore them. You will save them. You will take away their sins. And you will save a vast number of Gentiles. You'll save a vast number of those who are in the church today throughout the world. And so, Father, we say, we praise you. We glorify thy name. We lift your name high. We say thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done in our lives, but for your great sovereign plan of redemption. And we, and we pray these things and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.